questions. Question oral, uh, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. According to our intelligence services, the dictatorship in Beijing gave $140,000 to the Trudeau Foundation. The reason for the donation was to influence the Liberal leader, who is also Prime Minister, who is now Prime Minister. Alexander Trudeau is the one who facilitated this donation from China. Had it been anyone else, we would have called them to Parliament to answer questions. So, will the Prime Minister support a motion to call Alexander Trudeau to appear before a parliamentary committee to answer questions about this donation, which sought to influence the Prime Minister? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, as I've said many times in this House, for 10 years, I've had no direct or indirect ties to the foundation which bears my father's name. As for committee, the member knows full well that committees decide independently who will appear. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister takes Canadians for fools. He really thinks Canadians are going to believe that he has no ties to the Trudeau Foundation? Trudeau Foundation donors pay for his vacation. His own brother facilitated and signed off on a donation from China to the Foundation, a donation whose goal was to influence the Prime Minister. So if the Prime Minister is speaking the truth and has nothing to hide, will he then support a motion to call Alexander Trudeau to appear before a parliamentary committee to answer questions? Yes or no? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, I've already answered this question. As everyone here knows, for 10 years now, I've had no direct or indirect involvement with the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Foundation. So we should ask ourselves, though, why the Conservatives insist on spending their time attacking me and my family rather than talking about the budget, for instance, rather than talking about issues Canadians are dealing with every day. We here on this side are here to support Canadians through our grocery rebate, through dental care support, through our initiatives and programs which will help Canadians right away. The Leader of the Opposition. Hmm. This bureaucracy, though, costs $20 billion more a year. That translates to $1,300 per Canadian family in additional costs because of the government's spending. And what are they getting for all this spending? Fewer services. Public servants are striking. Taxpayers can't even get answers to their questions before filing their taxes on Monday. Taxpayers are not receiving services in exchange for their money. So should taxpayers themselves declare a strike? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, unlike the Conservative Party, on this side of the House, we support workers. We support unions in the important work that they do. We know that public servants offer important services to Canadians. The government values their work, especially during the past few years, which have been difficult. That's why we're working around the clock to reach a deal that will be fair for public servants and reasonable for taxpayers. We will continue to make sure that everyone at the bargaining table takes their work seriously, works seriously, and we will solve this issue the right way. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. A bureaucracy that costs $20 billion more per year. That's $1,300 per Canadian family, a 50 per cent increase. And for what? For immigration services not being delivered, for veterans who can't get answers to their, their requests, and now taxpayers who won't be able to get answers to their tax questions before the filing deadline on Monday. Given that uh, Canadian taxpayers are not getting the services they pay for. Is it time for them to go on strike as well? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Honourable Prime Minister. 
take no lessons from the Conservative Party of Canada, whose approach on services to Canadians was uh, to close Veterans Affairs offices, cuts uh, with services to women, uh, to fight with the unions, including uh, with legislation that was anti-union, like 525 and 377, which that member voted in favour of, uh, or uh, furthermore, continuing to put cuts across the board. We've stepped up to support Canadians. Our public service stepped up to help Canadians through the pandemic, and now we're in negotiations to make sure we get the right deal for them and the right deal for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. This guy is so out of touch. Here we have 150,000 people on strike, the biggest federal strike in Canadian history. Canadians can't get their services. Meanwhile, their housing costs have doubled and crime is ravaging through our streets. And what is he going to do today? Well, start spreading the news. He's leaving today. <laughs> he wants to be a part of it. New York, New York. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Remind the honourable members that singing is not allowed. Whether it's good or bad, it's not allowed. small-time blues. They're melting away. I'll make a new start of it in old New York. Mr. Speaker, I can't sing very well, but at least I pay for my hotel rooms. Will he pay for his hotel costs when he goes to New York tonight? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, over the past number of years, we've spent time uh, across the world promoting Canada, promoting Canadian workers. Uh, we've been talking about the leadership on environmental responsibility, the reconciliation with Indigenous people. I, I'm going to have to interrupt the Honourable, uh, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Uh, the Honourable Leader of the Opposition has got everyone excited. I just want everybody to calm down, take a deep breath, and listen to the answer, please. The Right Honourable Prime Minister from the top so we can all hear the answer. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Over the past number of years, as uh, Canadians know, we've been talking about what we've been doing here in Canada, singing the praises, quite literally, of Canadian, uh, Canadian workers, uh, of Canadian companies, of Canadian know-how. As we lead on fight against climate change, as we step up on Indigenous reconciliation, as we we invest in the middle class uh, with measures like dental care and cuts to the uh, cuts to the middle class taxes that the Conservatives voted against, and that has led to companies like Volkswagen, uh, like Michelin, uh, like others investing in Canada because they see what we're doing. We will continue to promote Canada and Canadian workers right across the country. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Please, Mr. Speaker, for heaven's sake, don't let MPs sing. But I have another request. Here's a question. So they say that the Prime Minister has had no direct or indirect ties to the Trudeau Foundation for 10 years. Well, remind me not to go to his Christmas party, because it must be rather tense. We know that there were five deputy ministers in the prime minister's office to talk to the prime minister's uh, family foundation, the Trudeau Foundation. Now, a prime minister can't allow himself to be ignorant. The prime minister must have been curious. So what was decided at that meeting? The, hon the right honorable prime minister, Mr. Speaker, as we've already answered in this house, neither myself nor my staff took part in the meeting. The meeting occurred with public servants in a building in which public servants work. The member across the way perhaps does not understand. Perhaps he doesn't understand because there was a misunderstanding after 10 years of Harper government, a misunderstanding of where the line is between the government and the public servants. and and where the line is for the PMO. But we keep the PMO separate from the public service, and we will continue to do the work Canadians expect us to do. The Honourable Member for Belay Chambly. Mr. Speaker, we have a Prime Minister who is bragging about being ignorant, unaware. What can this lead up to? Now, he is credible. It's, we can believe him when he says he's ignorant, but if he wants to remain ignorant, if he's not asking any questions, that's a whole other problem. 
He is demonstrating, Mr. Speaker, that the Prime Minister is not participate, should not participate in the decision on who should lead the necessary investigation about Chinese interference in Canada. Wouldn't you agree, Mr. Speaker? A quick reminder, I would like to remind members that it's a fine line between calling someone a name and referring to something. I'd like to remind members to please be careful about what they're doing. I know everyone here is very competent and thinks carefully about what they say. So I wanted to issue this reminder to please not call each other names. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. We all know full well the Bloc Québécois' stance on Canadian institutions. Here's the reality, though. These unfounded, baseless attacks on the integrity of a man like David Johnston, our former Governor General, are not worthy of this place. He is a man who worked tirelessly, heart and soul, to serve our country. He was always of the utmost integrity, and that's why he's the right person to be our independent expert to look into the very important matter of foreign interference. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Mr. Speaker, with each passing day of the strike, we see the Liberal government's true face, and it ain't pretty. The workers want something very simple. They want their salary to keep pace with inflation. This government, though, is not giving workers what they want and need. Will the Prime Minister wake up, shoo his minister out of the way, do his job, and intervene to get a fair deal for these workers? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I must admit that I'm confused. Confused to have to explain to an NDP member how bargaining works. Bargaining has had some strikes. There have, uh, there have been some difficulties, some challenges at the bargaining table for the past eight days, but everyone is working productively and constructively. In fact, government uh, negotiators have just put an offer on the table that meets the recommendations of a, of an, of a third party expert, so this is a great action. Negotiations are moving forward. That's how things go when one respects unions. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. If the Minister was serious about respecting these workers, he wouldn't be jetting off to New York at a time when we have the yep. biggest strike here, here, here. in our country's history. Absolutely. That doesn't show respect to workers. Workers aren't buying it. We're not buying it. If the, if the Prime Minister was serious about this, he could show some leadership and certainly not allow the minister that put us in this mess to continue to do this work. So will the Prime Minister accept that this is serious, it requires the full attention of government, then he's got to get serious about getting a contract for these workers now. Here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I do find it a little odd that I'm having to explain to a member of the NDP how collective bargaining works, but sometimes it takes time. Uh, and that work that's being done constructively at the negotiation table, including the fact that we put forward uh, just, uh, just, just yesterday uh, an offer that aligns exactly with the recommendations of a third-party expert in this issue, that is the basis uh, for a good deal moving forward that both respects our public servants uh, and uh, is fair for, for, uh, for taxpayers. That's what we're going to continue to work on. That's right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Prime Minister can't believe he's having to explain to the Leader of the NDP, talking down to a member of his own coalition government <laughs> just demonstrates how arrogant and out of touch this Prime Minister has become. Today, for example, he'll hop on his private jet and fly, fly off on vacation to hang out with the stars and give speeches, uh, self-important and self-indulgent speeches at Canadian taxpayers' expense, all the while he's putting in place a 41 cent a litre carbon tax that will cost the average family $1,500 more. Why doesn't he yeah. axe the trip? and axe the tax. Yeah, yeah. Honourable Prime Minister.
$976, Mr. Speaker. That's what an average family of four in that member's riding uh, will be getting this year with the Climate Action Incentive. Uh, that's because not only are we moving forward uh, with a price on pollution that helps fight climate change, but uh, we're giving money back uh, to average families across the country uh, in jurisdictions where it applies that leave eight out of ten of them better off. This is how we both fight climate change and support families while, Mr. Speaker, drawing in global investments like Michelin, uh, like Volkswagen, like others who want to be part of Canadian workers' successes. Leader of the Opposition. When he said uh, 900 and something dollars, I thought for a moment that that was the price of his New York hotel room. I thought, no, that can't be true. It'll be in the thousands. But, but Mr. Speaker, he's spreading disinformation again. He promised he was going to censor misinformation. Why doesn't he censor himself? Because look at the information coming from the parliamentary budget officer he appointed, which demonstrates that the average Canadian will spend at least $1,500 more in taxes than they get back in rebates. The Liberals call this report a prop. It's from the parliamentary budget officer, the one they appointed. They're called facts. Will he finally listen to them? I feel like, like, like I'm explaining a lot today. If, if you're reading from something like I'm reading right now, it's something. It's, it's, a, it's a resource. It's a source. If I hold it up like this, it's a prop. And nobody wants to hold up a prop. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I can tell you he wasn't reading from the PBO report because the PBO report has actually decried uh, the fact uh, that it is being misinterpreted deliberately, indeed, by the Conservatives. The reality is, and the report is very clear, eight out of ten families in jurisdictions where the price on pollution applies do better with this price on pollution. But what the Leader of the Opposition doesn't want to talk about is the fact that having no plan, as he doesn't, to fight climate change is not going to create jobs for Canadians, not create growth for the economy, and not leave Canadians better off in the coming years. That's the Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Well, it's now clear why he wants to censor the internet, Mr. Speaker. He doesn't want Canadians to go and find out which of us is telling the truth. It would be very easy for them. I encourage them to Google a distributional analysis of the federal fuel charge on the 2030 emissions reduction plan. Page three. If you're out there watching, Google it now. You will see the Prime Minister is deliberately misinforming the House of Commons by stating that Canadians will be better off when clearly the average household will pay more than $1,500 more in taxes yep. than they get back. Would the Prime Minister like me to have one of the pages send this document over so that he can read it? Honourable, the Right Honourable Leader of the uh, sorry, the Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker. The Conservative government would still choose. The Conservative opposition chill, still chooses to contend that there is no cost for inaction. Get used to it. to remind the honourable members to maybe take direction from their whip. Just look at her or him, I mean, like, you know, but, and just listen. You're good? Okay, I got your word for it. Good. I'll take their word for it. The Right Honourable Prime Minister from the top. Mr. Speaker, the Conservative Party of Canada continues to refuse to understand that you cannot have a plan for the future of the economy if you do not have a plan to fight climate change. Uh, they are continuing uh, to choose uh, to mislead Canadians, to confuse the issue, uh, and uh, to harm workers across this country. If Volkswagen chose to come to invest in Canada, if Rio Tinto is making investments in Canada, if uh, ArcelorMittal is investing in Hamilton, these are things that are happening because of the leadership Canadians, Canadian government, Canadian workers are showing in tackling climate change and building a stronger future. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition.
Mr. Speaker, he does not have an environmental plan. He has a tax plan. Since he brought in the carbon tax, he has not succeeded in reaching a single solitary emissions reduction target. That is because taxing people for something they have no choice but to use does not change the environment, Mr. Speaker. Canadians have to drive. They have to heat their homes. But this Prime Minister chooses to put the burden on the working class, 60 percent of whom will pay more in taxes than they get back in rebates, instead of putting it on himself. Why doesn't he, he cancel his hypocritical, high-flying lifestyle and the tax at the same time? Yeah. Yeah. The Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the Leader of the Opposition has a significant task ahead of him in convincing Canadians over the next couple of years uh, that it would be better for them if we didn't fight climate change, if we didn't show leadership on the environment, if we didn't show investments in cleaner technologies, uh, convincing people in St. Thomas that it is a waste of money uh, to be investing in uh, the, uh, the Volkswagen plant. These are the kinds of things that he's going to have to try and convince Canadians of, and all the fancy rhetoric he tries to use will not fool Canadians. The reality is, Canadians know environment and economy go together. Here, here. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The big task I have ahead is cleaning up the mess here. that he will be... for him because he's made another promise. This is the guy who said the, he spent billions of dollars on the infrastructure bank, hasn't completed a single project. He said it would only cost $7 billion to build the Trans Mountain Pipeline. It's up to $30 billion, yeah. wow. and it's not even built. Yeah. He said his $89 billion of spending on housing affordability would make things affordable. House prices have doubled. Why is it that the, the more he, he spends, the worse things get? Yeah. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we know the Conservative instinct is to cut. That's what the Conservative Party has always done. That's what the Conservative government did in years past, whether it was cutting veteran services, uh, cutting, uh, cutting initiatives that supported and fought child poverty, uh, cutting housing programs, cutting pensions, uh, cutting everything they could, because that somehow would lead to growth. Well, it didn't, Mr. Speaker. What has led to growth was investing in the middle class and people working hard to join it, cutting taxes for the middle class and raising them on the wealthiest 1% the Conservatives voted against. Most recently, delivering dental care for low-income Canadian kids. Conservatives voted against. We will continue to be there for Canadians. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Tim used to be in the way of Canadians, Mr. Speaker. He wants to bring in a 41 cent a litre tax on Nova Scotians that he claims will help the environment. Meanwhile, a project that actually would have helped the environment, the Sustainable Marine Project, which would have used tidal energy, the waves of the ocean to generate electricity, that project has been cancelled because the Prime Minister's federal bureaucracy was too slow and incompetent to approve it. Now the company's getting up and leaving. So how does this sound? Why doesn't he get out of the way of Nova Scotians, let them generate clean electricity, okay. and cancel the carbon tax on their back? The right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we've worked with provinces and initiatives and proponents across the country on historic investments in clean energy, uh, in transition towards uh, de decarbonizing our traditional energy sources. This is what we will continue to do to ensure that Canada is ready for the opportunities and the investments that are coming in to create great jobs for workers right across the country. That's what our budget is focused on, creating those great jobs for the middle class in critical minerals, in manufacturing, in CCUS, uh, in energy, in a range of things that are going to position Canada as that supplier of energy and resources the net zero world needs. Excellent. The Honourable Member for Belle Chambly. Mr. Speaker, I don't have anything against Mr. Johnston personally, but if I'm remembering correctly, he was the commissioner of a debate when the leader of the a debate called Quebecers racist and refused to apologize. We all remember that. Mr. Johnston is connected to the Trudeau Foundation. The Trudeau Foundation sought a donation from the University of Montreal, and the brother of Mr. Trudeau signed off on the donation from China. Thirty members of the foundation recently resigned. Now, I 
don't know whether the Prime Minister is ignorant or not. He is a great actor and comedian, but does he ignore that the right honorable Prime Minister? I know that it might surprise everyone in this house, but apparently, surprise, the Bloc Québécois doesn't like David Johnston. Fine. Well, David Johnston has proven his integrity and dedication to Canada, not throughout a few years of service, but throughout decades of service in our institutions. He is exactly the right person to investigate independently all the infrastructure and programs that we have to fight against foreign interference. He is the right person to ensure Canadians that we are doing what we should. The Honourable Member for belle chambly Hmm. Not directly related to the Trudeau Foundation. Well, the Trudeau Foundation is a liberal incubator for everyone who runs in liberal circles, even for people who don't know that and now regret their ties to the Foundation, such as former scholarship recipients. The Prime Minister and his close circle tolerate interference they tolerate issues with our institutions. Doesn't the Prime Minister realize that when he talks about the Chi that Chinese Prime Minister, it's all just a joke? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, we know the Bloc Québécois is gleeful to attack the legacy of Pierre Elliott Trudeau, of everything that my father accomplished. But here's the reality, Mr. Speaker. We will always promote intelligent debate in this country. That is something the Foundation is doing. I can't say more because, as the member knows full well, it's been 10 years that I've had no direct or indirect engagement with the Trudeau Foundation. Mr. Speaker, the Prime Minister is continuing his crusade against Indigenous hunters and farmers as well. He is attacking them by trying to ban hunting weapons. Does he really think that hunters in the Saguenay are responsible for the shooting in Montreal? That makes no sense, Mr. Speaker. He should go after true criminals instead of Indigenous peoples and hunters in our regions. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Once again, Mr. Speaker, the spokesperson of the American Firearms Association is saying nonsense. Next month will mark the third year of our elimination of assault-style rifles in Canada. It is now illegal to buy or sell them. But the Conservative Party of Canada wants to bring back assault weapons. We won't allow it. That's why I ask everyone in this House to support the Bill C-21 when it comes before this House. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The demagoguery of a Prime Minister that divides to distract. Right. He calls Indigenous Canadians in Nunavut who hunt for sustenance Americans. He calls our patriotic farmers who use rifles for pest control Americans. He, ca he calls decent, hard-working, law-abiding citizens who've never broken a law in their lives, Americans, because they disagree with his plan to ban hunting rifles. Will he stop dividing to distract and start going after the real criminals? Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, the length to which the Leader of the Opposition will go to try and pretend that he is not in the pocket of the NRA is quite humorous. The reality is the talking points they put out there completely distracted from, disconnected from any reality. Three years ago, we made the decision to render assault-style weapons in this country, uh, d weapons designed to kill the largest number of people as quickly as possible, illegal in our communities. We banned them from being bought, sold, or used. Uh, this is what we are continuing with. This is what he stands against. Right. The Leader of the Opposition. Yeah is he put all the resources into going after licensed, law-abiding, 
trained and tested firearms owners who are the statistically the least likely people to commit a crime. Meanwhile, he has turned loose onto our, our streets repeat violent offenders who have committed literally dozens of violent offenses. In Vancouver, under his bail regime, the same 40 people had to be arrested 6,000 times. Wow. That is what he has brought to our streets. Crime, chaos, drugs, and disorder. Why won't he start going after the real criminals with a common sense, Justin? Yeah. Yeah. The right honorable prime minister. If the Conservative Party was serious about going after crime, they would support our freeze on handguns. Uh, they would support the fact that we are uh, we have uh, banned assault style of uh, assault style weapons, uh, and that is something uh, that they continue to avoid, to dodge, to spread misinformation and disinformation on. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, we've continued to invest in police when the Conservative government before me cut services and funding to police. They cut services to CBSA. They cut initiatives that actually kept Canadians safe, and now they're just in the pockets of the NRA. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Why does he ban BB guns and paint guns and the hunting rifles of Indigenous and rural Canadians? But you know what? Enough about... Let's, have, let's just have the facts. Under the Conservative government, violent crime went down 22%. Under this Prime Minister, it's gone... 32%, 92% increase in violent gang crime under this Prime Minister. These are the facts. Will he listen to the facts and the common sense and go after the real violent criminals instead of targeting law-abiding rifle right. owners and hunters? The right honourable Prime Minister that wants to look at numbers, you should perhaps look at the number of assault-style weapons purchased by Canadians under the 10 years of Stephen Harper's government. And you would see the challenges we're facing right now. The fact is, Mr. Sorry, I'm going to have to interrupt the Right Honourable Prime Minister again. I, I'm having a hard time hearing his answer. I know there's some people who get excited when we talk about certain items. I just want them to take a deep breath. Okay, now that everybody's taken that breath. The Right Honourable Prime Minister from the top, please. Mr. Speaker, you cannot be serious about keeping our communities safe if you stand against gun control. And that's consistently what the Conservatives have done, uh, by spreading misinformation and disinformation uh, when we are going after assault-style weapons and putting a freeze on handguns uh, and uh, not going after law-abiding hunters and fishers. They are using that to try and scare people uh, when the reality is keeping Canadians safe requires a multifaceted approach. It means uh, investing more in CBSA, which has cut uh, more than in half the number of interdicted guns, uh, doubled the number of interdicted guns coming across the border. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Public service workers have been waiting for over two years for a fair contract. Liberals like to talk a lot about workers' rights, but when they offer workers in the public sector what is effectively a pay cut, when they're asking for salaries that keep up with inflation, they're no better than Conservatives. Right. So will the Prime Minister get serious about these workers, cancel his trip, and get these workers a fair contract? Here, here, here. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we take seriously the responsibility of engaging constructively uh, with labour unions. That's why we are right now at the negotiating table. That's why our negotiators have put forward a, uh, an offer that is actually aligned perfectly with the recommendation of third-party experts as uh, a pathway to solution. And it is certainly something that we're going to be able to build on together, see built on at the negotiating table. We have full confidence, not just in our negotiations, Negotiators and our minister, Mr. Speaker, but in uh, the union negotiators who are fighting for better opportunities for their folks, uh, and we know that that's how you get to the right deal at the table. That's right. That's it. Honorable member for Burnaby South. This is starting to get ridiculous. In our country, Galen Weston earns over 430 times what the median income of an employee that, at that company. Uh, I'm sorry. I, I, it's not, one second. You can start from the top, please. Appreciate it. Uh, and we'll just ask everybody to keep it down. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. This situation and the Conservatives are getting ridiculous. We've got a situation where Galen Wesson is earning over 430 times what the median income
income of an employee at his company is making, and the Prime Minister wants to do nothing about that, but a janitor working in the public service can't even have a salary that keeps up with inflation. What is going on with that picture? I know that the janitor can offer the Prime Minister a fancy vacation, but the Prime Minister should agree that that janitor deserves respect. Will he cancel his trip and negotiate a fair contract for these workers? Here, here, here. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, one of the very first things, no, the very first thing we did when we came to office was lower taxes for the middle class and raise them on the wealth it's one percent. Unfortunately, not just the Conservatives voted against that, the NDP voted against that uh, back when we first got elected. The reality is, Mr. Speaker, we will continue to step up for the middle class. We will continue to invest in things like child care, like dental care, like public health care, uh, like supports for seniors, like supports for students. We know that you build a strong economy from the bottom up and the centre out. That's exactly what we're doing. Okay, everybody's excited today. And what I found worked in the past is I have a list here that's been worked on by both sides. But, you know, the only tools I have is I can work with this list. I can follow it, but I can bounce around wherever. So whoever's constantly a noise, the folks in the back at the end of the list, you might want to prepare because you may be called on for a question. The Honourable Member for Guelph. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, workers and families in southwestern Ontario still remember the Ford plant in St. Thomas, Ontario being shuttered in 2011. It put thousands out of work and it left the region's once thriving auto sector on life support. These types of closures were just all too common under the Harper Conservatives, Shameful. which is one reason why this, le this week's historic announcement with Volkswagen has come to them as such welcome news. Of course, Mr. Speaker, not everyone in this chamber welcomed this historic investment. While Conservatives may choose to attack this deal, can the Prime Minister update the House on what it means for our communities, our economy, and our environment? Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the member for Guelph for his important question and his extraordinary hard work. That's it. Volkswagen's decision to build their first North American battery facility in Canada is a generational investment in jobs and clean growth. The plant will create thousands of direct and tens of thousands indirect jobs in St. Thomas and across Canada's battery and EV ecosystems. While the Leader of the Opposition continues to bet against Canada and our workers and prefers to call it a waste, on this side we will continue to push for a strong economy, good paying jobs and cleaner air. That's it. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. The average Canadian household would have to spend 63% of their pre-tax income to make monthly payments on the average home, something that's mathematically impossible. Some are now having to pay $2,400 to rent a room in a townhouse, not the townhouse, a room and the privilege of having five or six other roommates with them after house prices and housing costs have doubled under this Prime Minister. How did he spend so much to achieve such bad results? Yeah. Right, Honourable Prime Minister. After 10 years of a Conservative government under-investing in housing, if investing at all, uh, we brought forward uh, in 2017 a national housing strategy that has created uh, new opportunities for millions of Canadians to get into homes. We've continued to invest in things like the Housing Accelerator that works with municipalities uh, to create hundreds of thousands of new homes over the coming years. We're doubling uh, housing stock, uh, housing creation in this housing over the next 10 years with investments like the Rapid housing accelerator, with direct supports for home buyers, uh, with uh, tax-free savings accounts. There is no one silver bullet on this, but we're delivering them all. The Leader of the Opposition. He's got a, an accelerator. Well, I've got news for him. You can't live in an accelerator, Mr. Speaker. You have to live in a house or apartment. And under his leadership, the cost of the average two-bedroom apartment has doubled from $1,172 to $2,205. The cost of an average mortgage payment has doubled to over $3,000. And now the share of your monthly income you have to spend to own the average home is two-thirds. 
a, by far a record-smashing number. Again, how did he spend so much to achieve such horrible results for home buyers? Honorable Prime Minister. Over the past eight years, we have consistently invest, uh, invested in programs and supports for Canadians uh, that have delivered uh, many more opportunities for people, but we know there is more to do. But Canadians are free to contrast our uh, multi-layered, uh, broad approach on investing in housing with what the Conservative MPs got elected on in the last election, a promise uh, to give a tax break to landlords who sold their buildings. That was the entirety of the housing plan in the last election from the Conservative Party of Canada. We will continue to have real approaches that work for Canadians. That's right. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. His main criticism against the Conservative government is that our housing programs were not expensive enough. Right? <laughs> if only it had been more expensive to taxpayers, then it would have been a better program, Mr. Speaker. Yes, it's true. This Prime Minister is the heavyweight champion of government spending. The problem is he keeps delivering the worst possible results. House price costs have doubled under this Prime Minister. And then they're more expensive for the taxpayers who have to fund his incompetent programs at the same time. So why don't, why doesn't it say you stop wasting the money, start delivering more houses? The right honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, Conservative politicians still think you can cut your way to growth, because that's what they tried for 10 years under Stephen Harper uh, and failed, uh, and that's what they're continuing to propose now. Cuts and austerity. You can cut your way uh, to new jobs for Canadians. You can cut your way to fighting climate change. You can cut your way uh, to Indigenous reconciliation. Well, you can't, Mr. Speaker. And the, and the Conservative Party continues to cling to a trickle-down austerity approach that does not work for the middle class and people working hard to join it. That's where we will stay focused, and we'll take no less from that. That's it. That's it. Leader of the opposition. Let's look at the results. Under the previous Conservative government, the average mortgage payment on the average home newly purchased was $1,400. Now, eight years later, it's $3,200. Wow. He has delivered a 100% increase wow. in mortgage costs, all while bringing in an $89 billion taxpayer-funded boondoggle in the housing program. So that, once again, why won't he end the government waste, get out of the way so that we can build affordable housing in this country? The Honourable Prime Minister. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, I want to see the Leader of the Opposition get up again and explain to Canadians how great the 2008 recession was uh, for people in Canada, for people around the world. Because that's exactly what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying, Mr. Speaker. The fact of the matter is uh, we, the cuts, the austerity, the trickle-down approach that Conservatives always put forward failed Canadians. Uh, that's why we've invested in the middle class and people working hard to join it to create economic growth, to create jobs, to lift people out of poverty, to create a plan to fight climate change and build a future. That's what we're going to continue to do, Mr. Speaker. L'honorable député de Thérèse de Blainville. Monsieur le Président. Mr. Speaker, a week ago, Employees of the public service went on strike. It is more than time for the Prime Minister to take charge of this file. The current conflict was coming for some time, since 2021. They did not have a collective agreement in place. The Prime Minister's intervention is now necessary to get to a fast solution so that everyone can benefit when will he sit down at the negotiation table? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Among government negotiators and union representatives, everyone is working in good faith at the negotiating table, and that's where everything happens. The government did put forward a proposal that lines up with recommendations from a third party who said that it was the right way to go. We put that proposal forward. It is certainly a base that we can use where we can hope to find an agreement in the days to come. We will continue to work while fully respecting, while working entirely with workers and unions, because that is what we do. 
The Honourable Member for Thérèse de Blainville. Mr. Speaker, he's not taking it seriously. The Prime Minister is hiding. He's letting this crisis go on, just like he let the crisis with passports and Roxham Road, the crisis with workers during the pandemic. Every time he lets a crisis go on, everybody else pays the prices, workers, Quebecers, everyone except him. Will he, for once, be proactive, respond to the calls of unions, and sit down at the negotiating table? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, that's exactly what we do. Our negotiators are putting forward responsible proposals. We are working in good faith with unions. And we hope to be able to resolve this challenge soon, because, yes, Canadians are expecting to get services from officials, as officials have delivered over the last years, which were difficult. We're going to find the right agreement for taxpayers and for public servants, and that is the work we're doing together right now. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Deficits are driving up interest and mortgage rates on home buyers, and government gatekeepers are preventing home construction. We rank second last for housing permit times in all of the OECD, and we have the fewest houses per capita in the G7, even though we have the most land to build on. That is the Prime Minister's record. His solution is to give tens of billions of dollars more to the same municipal gatekeepers in order to block construction again. Why doesn't he link the infrastructure dollars we, the feds give to the cities to the number of houses that actually get built? The right honourable prime minister. Mr. Speaker, one thing we know the leader of the opposition is good at is picking fights, because that's exactly what he's proposing to do with municipalities. We choose instead to work collaboratively with them, to recognize the important role that municipalities across this country play in uh, delivering housing, uh, in accelerating the processes, that's the way to get things done. Through the pandemic, it was orders of government working together that supported Canadians. Uh, it is respect for municipalities that keeps us moving forward. Uh, and that's what we're going to continue to do. We remember well when that member was in government. Uh, the fact is there were constant fights with municipalities. We're delivering. Leader of the opposition. When Canadians are forced to live in tents or spend $2,500 to rent a single room in a townhouse or stuck in their parents' basement until they're 35, years old, you better believe I'm going to fight for more housing. Yeah. Yeah. someone other than himself and his yeah. gatekeeper friends. His solution is to build up these municipal gatekeeping bureaucracies with federal deficit finance tax dollars. That means that it will mean be even slower to get anything built. Why doesn't he link the number of dollars that cities get for infrastructure to the number of houses they allow to get built? Yeah. Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, we remember well that member's approach on fighting with municipalities, fighting with experts, fighting with, uh, with Elections Canada, fighting with anyone he could. And did that deliver for Canadians? Absolutely not, Mr. Speaker. Uh, right now he's fighting against local news for Canadians. What does he have against local Canadians, against local municipalities? The reality is we will continue to be there to work collaboratively, to build a stronger future, to invest in the kinds of things that are delivering for Canadians while he continues to propose cuts and fights that lead nowhere. That's right. Yeah. Leader of the Opposition. Actually, I delivered housing costs that were half of what they are right now. Those are the results. Sometimes you have to fight for the people, the common people, and rely on the common sense of the common people to get things done, Mr. Speaker. Right now, we have the biggest housing bubble in the G7, even though we have the most land per capita to build on. The solution is to incentivize municipalities to speed up permits so that we can build more homes. Why doesn't he link the number of dollars cities get for infrastructure to the number of houses they allow to get built, require every federally funded transit station have housing around it, and sell off federal buildings to build homes that people can afford? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. 
he wants to pretend he fights for ordinary Canadians, but he's not fighting for St. Thomas right now. No. He's not fighting for communities that need investment, that need opportunities to build those communities, to be there, uh, to support schools and after-school programs and hospitals and businesses uh, in the kind of ecosystem that gets when you have a big investment like Volkswagen landing uh, once again. After the Ford plant left under his leadership, uh, we're moving forward on delivering for Canadians. And one of the great ways to make sure Canadians can better afford their homes is to have good paying jobs, which again, with their attacks on unions and the middle class, they're not going to deliver. Mr. Speaker, our official language minority communities are facing several challenges. As the former minister for la francophonie, I, at the provincial level, I see the needs for investments to deal with labor shortages. This morning, I had the pleasure of attending the disclosure of the new action plan on official languages, which will set out a roadmap for the next five years. Can the Prime Minister inform this House about what this plan includes? The Right Honourable Prime Minister. I thank the member for Halifax West for the question and for her hard work. This morning, we revealed our new action plan on official languages. It includes historic investments to protect and promote our official languages. With this plan, we're investing more than $4 billion in targeted areas like francophone immigration, education, and the shortage in bilingual labor. Rather than making cuts, our government is standing up for linguistic minorities throughout the country. The Honourable Leader of the Opposition. When a family has to pay $2,500 just for a room, just for a room in a house, when 1.5 million Canadians are using food banks, some are looking for medical assistance in dying because they are too poor to keep living. He charged $6,000 for a hotel room in London. Could he show a little respect for people who are paying his bills and announce today that he's going to pay that $6,000 back for the hotel rooms in London? The Right Honourable Prime Minister, Mr. Speaker, while the leader of the Conservative Party keeps focusing on attacks on me, I will continue to tackle the challenges that Canadians are facing. That's why with Budget 2023, we announced reimbursement for groceries that will help about a million Canadians. It will give them some assistance to deal with rising costs of food. We're setting up dental care for Canadians that have medium and low incomes who don't have insurance because we know that's something that improves quality of life and takes pressure off family budgets. We we'll continue to be there while the Conservatives keep voting against these measures. The Leader of the Opposition. Five million people to the food bank, forcing families to spend 2500 bucks to rent a single room in a townhouse causing the highest food price inflation in a generation. He's off to New York to celebrate again. It's the same Prime Minister who spent $6,000 on a single hotel room for a single night at taxpayers' expense. Shameful. Will he show a little decency and announce today that he will pay that $6,000 back to Canadian taxpayers? Honourable <laughs> Prime Minister. The member opposite continues to make misleading, unfounded personal attacks on me. I will continue uh, to focus on delivering for Canadians. Things that he doesn't want to talk about, like uh, the dental care benefits that they voted against that are delivering dental services to 250,000 kids so far and keep going. Uh, why they won't, won't, don't want to talk about the $10 a day child care that's being delivered in six out of 10, uh, six uh, out of 13 provinces and territories right now with child care fees cut in half, saving thousands of dollars for average families across the country. These are the things we're going to continue to invest in. Honourable Leader of the Opposition. Mr. Speaker, he's already admitted that it was him that stayed in that $6,000 a night room. He tried to cover it up for months, but he got caught. And now Canadians know that while they're eating at food banks, while they're skipping meals, 
while they're crammed into one bedroom in a townhouse. He's spending $6,000 of their tax dollars per night on a single room. I will make him a deal. I will never raise this issue again if he stands today and announces he will pay the money back. Will he do that for Canadians? It's interesting to see the lengths to which the Conservative leader will go to not talk about our budget, to not talk about child care, which he stands against, child care that has saved hundreds of dollars a month uh, for Canadians across this country, and he won't talk about it because he's ideologically opposed to child care, or at least some of his team is. Uh, he won't talk about dental care being delivered for low-income Canadian kids. These are things that he voted against as well things that are helping Canadians. These are things that he will continue to stand against and look for anything he can do to talk about anything else other than things that help Canadians. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Lakeshore. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Prime Minister. Months after an election where pensions were never mentioned, Stephen Harper in 2012 shocked the world when he announced at the World Economic Forum I just want to point out that just because there's no questions left today for certain people doesn't mean there's no carryover to the next one. To scrambling them a bit might be the new process we have to go to. The Honourable Member for Mississauga Lakeshore from the top, please. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. That's right. He shocked the world at the World Economic Forum, saying that major transformations were coming to seniors' pensions. Well, this meant raising the age of retirement from 65 to 67 and forcing vulnerable Canadians to work longer before, before having access to their hard-earned pensions. Can the Prime Minister please update the House on what our government has done to fix that reckless mistake? Mr. Speaker. Honourable Prime Minister. I want to thank the member from Mississauga Lakeshore for his question, his tireless advocacy and his hard work. Indeed, one of the very first things we did when we took office was to cancel the Harper Conservatives' plan for seniors and bring the age of retirement back down to 65. Instead of cutting OAS and GIS payments as they did, we raised them, and that led us to having the lowest poverty rates among seniors in the world. And now we're trying to get the new grocery rebate legislation through the Senate to make life more affordable for seniors. Well, we hope that the partisanship of today's Conservative Party in the Senate will not be an obstacle in helping Canadians retire with financial security. The Honourable Member for Burnaby South. Thank you. At some point, it just gets ridiculous. At some point, it just gets ridiculous. A firefighter who works for the government asks for a pay raise to keep up with inflation and pay the rent, dealing with unprecedented inflation and... The Prime Minister, hand on heart, tells us how hard things are. The facts show he doesn't understand anything. It's just a bad play. Will this Prime Minister finally take the situation seriously, cancel his trip outside the country, and do the work that's required to get to a fair contract for workers, the right honourable Prime Minister? Mr. Speaker, as I said, we've put forward an offer at the negotiating table through our negotiators. It presents a level of compensation that is in line with what a third-party expert recommended as a good solution. It's a good starting point for negotiations over the coming days. The work will continue. At the same time, I have to highlight that one of the first things we did was to lower taxes for the middle class and raise them for the wealthiest 1 percent, and the NDP did vote with the Conservatives against that measure. The Honourable Member for Richmond, Arthabasca. Mr. Speaker, everyone knows just how important the student employment program is to support community organizations, day camps, small businesses, and farming businesses. It's also essential for our youth so that they can have opportunities 
in various sectors to engage with the labor force. That's even more true with the inflationary crisis and the shortage of labor we're experiencing now. The Prime Minister and the Liberal government brags about supporting youth. I would like him to explain why this year budgets and subsidies for student employment were cut by a third. The Right Honourable Prime Minister. Mr. Speaker, during the pandemic, we boosted youth employment programs to help. Now that the worst part of the pandemic crisis is over, we are coming back to the levels that we had pre-pandemic. We've invested, however, in different programs to help youth. Youth no longer have to pay interest on their student loans, on federal student loans, rather. There's been significant investments in programs and bursaries for them. We'll continue to be there for youth, but I want to thank my colleague for his excellent question. That's all the time we have for questions today. That's all the time we have for question period today. Order first. Uh, I'm now uh, prepared to rule on a point of order raised on April 25th, and I'll get back to you. Uh, that was raised by the member for Sherbrooke Park. For